Good morning, Five Points Community Church. It is good to be here. Thank you, Pastor JJ, for your kind invitation, for your encouragement and ministry and fellowship in the Lord. A quick word to the graduates as you open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 for our scripture reading. Uh, congratulations to you for these milestone achievements and whatever you are doing next, if you are moving away, let me encourage you from jump to find a ministry that you can walk with because God did not design us to walk out our faith alone. We walk it with a community of believers. So let me encourage you to do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our scripture reading will be verses 1 through 7, and then we will finish at verses 16 through 18 as the chapter closes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now verse 16, again he says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal this is the word of the lord let me pray and then you can take a seat father with gratitude we gather on this lord's day to worship you we thank you that though our hearts are prone to wander, you draw us back again and again and again with the cords of your love. Lord, I ask that you would speak in power to every heart here through this, the word of God. That we would receive this, not as the word of men, but as it is the word of God, that it would be accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you would deliver us from a checkbox mentality that we would just be on autopilot but Lord that we would fix our eyes on the things that are above Lord I have prepared diligently but unless you move and blow on this it will be nothing but chicken scratch so Lord my trust is not in my delivery nor in anybody's capacity to hear but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Would he be poured out in full measure on all of us as we worship you through your word in Christ's name. Amen. All right you may grab a seat. Thank you. Life in a fallen world in general, widespread compromise among Christians and churches in particular, of which we've seen in spades, I think, in the last few years, coupled with the struggles that we all just experience in life as yet fully 
redeemed sinners. We're redeemed, but we're awaiting our glorification. Our stuff comes in the mix, and all of that comes together and pours us a nasty Molotov cocktail called discouragement. You've probably drank that cocktail once or a thousand times in your life. Well, to use the language of our text, there is ample opportunity for us, as the apostle writes, to lose heart. Verse 1 and verse 16, you caught that expression he spoke of twice. To become discouraged. And there's actually a couple shades of meaning with the expression to lose heart or become discouraged. One nuance is this. It means to become weary. You ever get to a point where you're like, I just can't do this anymore. I'm done. I quit. The word can carry the idea of becoming weary to the point of quitting. All of us have been there in some lane of life at some time in our walk with Christ, I'm sure. Or if you live long enough, you will. The other nuance is to become wobbly. The meaning of the word can also mean to become and act cowardly. So in other words, not only you become weary to the point of quitting, if not that, you become wobbly to the point of compromising what God has delivered once for all to the saints. It's not just pastors who experience this temptation, it's people in the pew. Because the fact of the matter is, life is not lived behind a pulpit or in a pew, life is lived in life, right? And if you're a Christian, you have ministry, if you will, responsibility. You have a calling as a single, right? As you walk with the Lord. You have ministry as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother, as a student, as, as a teammate, as a neighbor, as an employee, as an employer. You have responsibilities as you walk with the Lord. And maybe you would say, you know what? I have been trying in some or many of these lanes that God has put me in to really live for the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to be faithful. And yet, truth be told, I ain't seen much fruit at all. In fact, what's worse, I'm getting pushed back. I'm getting labeled. I'm getting ostracized. And then again, you bring your own stuff, your own struggles, your own issues, your own conflicts to the mix, and all of that decidedly can take a toll on your psyche to where you become weary to the point of saying, I'm done, I quit, or wobbly, and you begin to capitulate and compromise. Well, the guy who wrote these words, he took a lot of flack, both inside the church and outside the church. Paul, the author, you know, they called him at Corinth weak and unimpressive. They blew off his counsel. They told lies about him. This is people in the church. They slandered him. They said he's just weak and unimpressive in his bearing and in his approach. They got mad at him for him doing his job and preaching the word and calling them to repentance. And in fact, I think that the cherry on top of this nasty Sunday that he was eating at the church at Corinth was this. That the people that were supposed to be loyal to him were more loyal to unloyal or disloyal ministers of the gospel. And that's just a smattering of what he experienced inside the church. Outside the church, Paul was not exactly voted most popular guy on campus. You go to chapter 11 of, of his resume of suffering, and you will see this dude had a Ph.D. in suffering and then some. And yet, while so many were, were bailing out because of weariness, or coasting along, trying to do anything to avoid any possible offense, becoming wobbly, not Paul. Paul remained faithful all the way to Rome where he would put his head on a block of wood and with one crunch and thud of an ax it would be separated from his body. So when Paul says we don't lose heart, this man's got credibility with me. I want to listen to him. So let's listen to him this morning together as I preach to you on encouragement for weary and wobbly hearts. Because if you're not there, you have been there, or you may be there even 
oh, in 47 minutes or whatever. Y'all with me? I'm not going to give you the number of points because I don't know if I'm going to get through them, okay? So I don't want to trap myself here. Plus, you'll time them out and you'll say, if that point was 17 minutes, then how long is this message going to be? But you can't fire me, so I guess I'm good, okay? So we're going to begin with this. Our motivation. This is foundational. Paul says, therefore, having this ministry, how? So you got you to speak back to me today, all right? How does he have this ministry? By what? By the mercy of God. He has his ministry because of the mercy of God. Paul never got over the mercy and grace that knocked him to the ground. You can read about that three times in the book of Acts. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. It was so significant. He never got over the mercy and grace of God that knocked him to the ground, made him alive in Christ, saved him, and then thrust him out to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He never got over it, did he? I mean, in a flash of light, his life and eternity are changed. And this mercy, not getting what he deserved, judgment, and grace, getting what he did not deserve, God's favor, that was a driving force in his life. Therefore, he says, having received this ministry by the mercy of God, a few years after his conversion, several years actually, he will write uh, some epistles to Timothy. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. And in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 of his first epistle, he says, he says this. He says that he is the chief of sinners. He says this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief or the foremost. And then he says this. For this reason I receive mercy... That in me first, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to everyone after me who were to believe in him for eternal life. I would say the mercy of God was something that he didn't treat glibly. Would you? In fact, he breaks out into doxology after that. He says, now, to the, he says, um, to the only God, to the king of the ages, immortal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and majesty and honor forever and ever. Amen. That's, 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 what, that's what an apprehension of grace should do. It should have a doxological eruption in your life. Thank you, Lord. And what is not, I think, irrelevant to the matter at hand is the next chapter in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He mentions two guys who walked away. You remember their names? Hymenius and Alexander. Today we have this flowery name called deconstruction. It's nothing new. It's in the Bible. It's called apostasy. And can I suggest to you that apostasy begins by yawning rather than marveling at the grace of God. Speaking of the grace of God, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was, but now, how sweet the Keep on, I don't know this song. I'm as smart as I look. What's the next line? You need to come up and sing it. You said that with confidence. John Newton, you know his story. You've heard it a thousand times. He was a slave owner. He became a slave himself, right? After God scooped him by grace, calls him into ministry, has a, a, a plaque in his study at his house, Deuteronomy 18, 15, you shall remember that you were a bondservant, a slave in the land of Egypt, but the Lord thy God redeemed thee. At the end of his life, one of his colleagues was visiting him. He was a great theologian now, John Newton, a pastor for many years and all of that. And he asked him for some wise words. I want to hear some wise words from this spiritual sage, expecting something really deep. And Newton has that memorable answer. I don't remember much, but two things I remember. That I am a great sinner and that Jesus is a great Savior. Hallelujah to that, right? So the fuel to keep on keeping on, to pressing through by the power of the Spirit, when you want to succumb to weariness and quit or succumb to wobbliness and become a coward, is remembering and relishing the mercy of God that saved you when you deserve nothing but God's judgment. Amen? We must, 
We must, I say to you, rev the tachometers of our heart. Get the RPMs up. Often, intentionally, to see how massively and lavishly God has drenched us with grace and at the cost, the deep blood-bought cost of the cross. If God had not saved you, you would be toast. But since he saved you, the rest of your life should be a toast to him. Great is your mercy, O Lord. So what's our first motivation? The mercy of God. Y'all with me? Number two. He then gets a little dark, but with purpose. The second encouragement for a weary and wobbly heart, it's not just our motivation, the mercy of God. It is our renunciation, what we must renounce. He says in verse 2, but we have renounced disgraceful underhanded ways literally the hidden things of shame being sneaky being sly being back roomish all of that right he amplifies and expands upon what that means with the next next sentence where he says this is what, this is what we renounce we refuse number one to practice cunning that term five times in your New Testament, every time in a negative sense of somebody being willing to do anything to trick or to misrepresent for personal gain. He says, we don't do that. He goes on to say, we refuse to tamper with God's word. Only time that expression occurs in the New Testament is right here. But in extra biblical literature, it frequently occurs, and it has reference to adulterating a substance so to, as to illicitly expand your profit. So, for instance, wine sellers would super dilute their wine with water, or people selling gold would adulterate their gold with inferior metals, but not reveal that to the purchasing person, to the buyer. You put all that together, what is clear? is Paul is saying, you got to resist the temptation to water down the truth so as not to get a potentially negative response. Because let's be honest, the temptation is there for all of us, is it not? And when there is a way to be intentionally ambiguous from the pulpit, in the lunchroom, at the supper table, on the ball field, in the meeting, wherever. There is, a, there is a way to be intentionally ambiguous. So if people who believe it that way want to take it that way, they can. And the people who take it that way want to take it that way, they can. And nobody's mad at you and everybody thinks you're just kind and cool. Right? Now, I want to be clear on this. There is a place for being judicious in our speech, right? We are, after all, to bear the fruit of the Spirit in our speech, right? We, we got enough, enough jerks for Jesus, so let's not get more of those, okay? But there's also cowards for Christ, isn't there not? Where you're deliberately obscuring the truth in the name of being winsome or something else. And really, you're not loving that person. You're loving yourself because you crave that person's affirmation. You feel what I'm saying? Can you think of a time that you have ever shrunk from the truth? Again, pulpit, kitchen table, meeting place, ball field, wherever. Can you think of that time? And anyone who's going to be 1% honest would say, of course I can. We've all experienced that temptation. Paul says, listen, babe, you must renounce that impulse. You got to. You got to say no to that temptation. Instead, he goes on to say, you must have a positive commitment to something else. He says, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. We must have a commitment to the positive declaration of truth, the positive sharing of truth. It's interesting, the word um, open declaration has reference to a lamp or to a light. Does not the scripture say that the lost person walks in darkness? Does not the scripture say that the whole world, in a sense, lies in darkness? 
And what Christians must do is live according to the truth and speak the truth because that's turning the light on. Have you ever been abruptly woken up from a deep sleep by a bright light? And what is your response to that? Thank you. Let me open my eyes up more and look at that light. You just wince away, right? But that's how the truth is going to be, right? So you can't flinch at people potentially wincing at the light. The light has to come, right? The light has to shine. Now, you don't have the gumption in yourself to do this, and that's why he goes on to say we do so in the sight of God, right? we got to keep our eyes on the ultimate audience that matters, the one who is and was and is to come, the living God before whom we live and breathe and have our being. So number two, our renunciation is messing with God's word to be popular and more palatable. Number three, again, he's getting a little dark here. He gives us our realization. Our motivation is the mercy of God. Our renunciation is messing with God's word. Our realization is that people are blind. I remember when I became a Christian, I was 26 in the Marine Corps. I just become a Christian, and uh, I received some pretty significant pushback from my family. Now, to be fair, I was a little bit of a pit bull in a china shop, so I think I had a lot of that coming to me. God tempers you over time, right? But nonetheless, uh, one of the statements was, what you believe is just so narrow. And that's some kind of gospel. She mocked me, you believe. I mean, look at the kind of people that believe, and look how few people believe. And she pointed to some weird people in our church, and we did have some weird people in our church. There's good weird and bad weird. Just be good weird, not bad weird, okay? Weird people everywhere. But you know, Jesus in the Scripture already beat her to the punch. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, there is a broad way that leads to destruction and a very, very narrow way that leads to life. So he said, he said at first, you're just quoting Jesus. And this thing about not very impressive people, well, read 1 Corinthians 1. If you're a Christian, God didn't choose you because he, he thought you would be a great catch for his team. He chose you because he loved you, right? Because he says he's chosen the weak things, the foolish things, the things that ain't much. That's who he chooses. So you're right, family member, who, by the way, I believe in the 11th hour of her life, confessed to Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Now, Paul, I think, trying to read under the text here, I think that's what he's speaking into. I think he's speaking into, you read through First and Second Corinthians, he was getting lambasted, right, for the gospel, for himself and for the gospel. And they would say, oh, this is some little great, great message you have. Look how ineffective it is, Paul. All the hooty tooties and, 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 and somebody, they, they think this stuff is nonsense. And Paul, I think, answers that resistant mentality with this. Verse 3, he says, yep, our gospel is veiled. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Here's why. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to have to go in here a little deep, and then we'll back out to make the bigger point. So, summon all the caffeine you can to your brain right now, all right? When, G, when, when Paul calls Satan the god of this world, is Paul saying that Satan is a god in the most literal sense? Yes or no? No. Why? Because there is only one true and living God. Isaiah 45, 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no other god. He's calling him God, Satan, small g, God, in the same way you remember in the Old Testament, Baal is called the God of the Canaanites, right? The writer's not saying, well, he's a God. He's saying he's the demon that particularly influences the Canaanites. And by the way, by the way, <laughs> this is not the point of the message, demonic activity is just as prevalent today and associated with all kinds of things that our culture is blessing. Think about that. Now here, he calls Satan the god of this world, meaning the one at the top of the hierarchy chart in the demonic realm, Beelzebul, the devil, Satan himself, he is the one who has a certain kind of influence in the world, right? 
Jesus calls him in Matthew 9 the prince of darkness and John 14 the prince of the world and even Paul will write in Ephesians 2 that he is the prince of the power of the air under the sovereignty of God Satan has a certain sway in the world okay now don't get it twisted this ain't yin, yin and yang this ain't dualism you know they're not equals okay this isn't Star Wars theology no, the Lord is Lord over everything. He's creator. The devil is created being who fell. That said, he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? Well, it is important also to know that people are already born blind, right? Like, he doesn't inaugurate their blinding we are born dead Ephesians 2 verse 1 in trespasses and sins right and people are actually really good on their own on rejecting light without the help of the enemy John three nineteen, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world but men love darkness rather than light why because their deeds were evil but Satan works overtime to keep blind people he uses all kinds of things. Don't have time to even begin to enumerate. You can think of them. Hypocritical Christians. Unloving Christians. Compromising Christians. Cowardly Christians. A world... I mean, he uses all kinds of stuff. And it's kind of like every human being is walking down the tunnel of depravity, but Satan comes along and pushes them back so they go all the farther down. Now... Let me give you an illustration to get to the point that I tried to prepare us, prepare us for. What is the most beautiful painting in the world? What do you think? Somebody name a painting. Mona Lisa. That's what somebody said at the Did God Really Say conference when I preached it, and I, I disagreed. I don't think it is she's the most, but, you know, we'll go with that, okay? All right. Let's say you take the most beautiful painting, which most people would say the Mona Lisa. Incredible. And you, so there's the Mona Lisa, and you have a blind man come up. The blind man is now standing, facing the Mona Lisa, the most beautiful painting on the face of the earth. And then you interrogate that, that blind man. You ask him a question. You say, hey, blind man, what do you think about the most beautiful painting in the world, the Mona Lisa that's right in front of you? And what did this blind man say? I have no idea what you're talking about. I can't see a thing. Now, would it occur to you to say, see, that painting is not the most beautiful painting in the world because if it was more beautiful, that man would be able to describe it. Would it occur to you to, would you say that? Would you say that? Why? Because he's blind. The problem is not the painting. The problem is the eyes of the person looking at the painting, the heart, right? The eyes in this case. But you understand, do you see the parallel, the illustration I'm making? Paul is saying the problem is not the gospel. The problem is the eyes and the hearts and the, brain, and the, and the thinking and the brains of unregenerate lost people. That's, that's the problem he's saying. P.E. Edwards put it this way. The unveiled gospel is veiled to them because it is veiled in them. Thus it is not the gospel, but they that stand condemned. The absence of belief and its saving effects shows their blindness. And Paul has just given us a dose of reality. People are blind. The problem is not then the message. So changing the message is not the answer, as many people do. Because when people change the message, you know, they, 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 they don't emphasize that, you know, Jesus Christ, you don't make him Lord, you submit to him as Lord. They don't emphasize repentance. They, you know, sins become mistakes and all that stuff. You know, we, we, we soften the hard edges of the gospel and our need for it. All you do when you do that is create a false image of God and paper mache Christians who will melt away under the, God, uh, uh, the water of God's judgment. Styrofoam Christians who will burn in the fire of God's judgment. No, 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 no. Don't do that. So the question is then, well, listen, if people are blind, what is it that we are to do? Glad you asked that question. His fourth point, our proclamation. We do the one thing that God has chosen to use to open the eyes of the blind and veiled. Our proclamation, fourth of all. And that begins with who 
he is. Paul was doing, was, let me just emphasize, Paul was committed to doing the one thing that could give sight to the spiritually blind. That is, proclaim the pure, unadulterated gospel. He puts it this way. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. That then reminds us of when we share the gospel, we begin with who Jesus is, that he's Lord. He's Lord of all. Again, you don't make him Lord, you, you submit to him as Lord. I think it was maybe eight months ago, ten months ago, uh, maybe a year ago, but th- th- there's a pastor, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you, you, don't, you haven't, but his name's Andy Stanley. And he, in large-hearted fashion, I'm, I, I'm being a bit sarcastic here, so forgive me, uh, on behalf of Christians, apologized to non-Christians for Christians telling non-Christians how they should live, Okay? Um, Now, you need to see that for what it is, a thinly veiled, clever and cunning misrepresentation designed to curry favor with the lost and Christianettes. You you can go to to, uh, conferences that teach you to do that with great skill. And the reason I say it's clever, because I haven't heard a Christian say to a non-Christian, you should live like I do. I mean, there's probably some jerk out there for sure, okay? So there's always an exception to it. But you know what? We are to unabashedly Somehow we've lost this in evangelism. We are to tell non-Christians, you are to live as God designed you to live. The one who gives you life and breath. That part of Acts 17 gospel proclamation is telling people, hey listen, your bank account is not your Lord. Your ethnicity, it's not your Lord. What you think your sexuality is, it's not your Lord. Your job is not your Lord or any number of other things we put on the throne of our heart. Only Jesus is Lord. Now submit to his lordship. This is what Paul says in Acts 17. I just referenced Acts 17. Paul does this. Do we do this today? Paul, Mars Hill, the area of pockets, he preaches the gospel and he says, he closes a sermon with this. The the times of ignorance God winked at. He overlooked grace, mercy, but now commands all people everywhere to try Jesus. No, he doesn't say that. He says repent, right? And he has, because he has ordained the, a, t- a day in which he is going to judge the world, judge the world, he, he did say that, by that man that he has ordained, whereas he has given assurance to all men and that he raised this one from the dead, Jesus Christ. Now, the truth of this, truth of the truth is, there's not a one of us who has lived, especially the way we're born in sin, as Jesus with, with Jesus as Lord, have we? So that's why we always hit the other side, too. Savior. He calls him Jesus Christ. That's not like Mike Hanafi, a surname or, or, or last name. It is a title. It's his anointed mission to be the Savior of the world. That we then tell people, guess what? Jesus lived the life you did not live. He submitted to the Lordship of God. He died the death that you should die. And he rose again from the dead. And when you turn to him in repentant faith, he receives you into his kingdom. You are born of the Spirit, and you are a child of God now and forever. And we don't capitulate. Paul again hits this in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, for the Jews, they demand what? Signs. And the Greeks seek. But what do we do? We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, folly or foolishness. But to those who are the called, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, in, in, in Corinth, the entertainment of the day was fancy speeches. That was the, the TikTok of the day. Is it talk tick or TikTok? I'm just, but I'm, I'm an old guy, okay? I know Facebook and that's it. But that was the social media of the day. People would come into town, they were, they were fancy orders and uh, they would get a topic a few days or weeks in advance, and they would show up at an appointed venue, and they would give a speech. Sometimes it sounds weird, but this is what the commentators say. They would actually grease themselves up 
all glistening in the sun and, 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 and wax flowery and pontificate ad nauseum about some subject. And what mattered was what they said is not what they said, but how they said it. Paul said, we don't play that game. Look what he says. We preach. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Doesn't mean, by the way, if you are sharing it work or at home or from here at the pulpit, that you don't share from your personality. That's impossible not to, right? Or your interest. Doesn't mean that it's bad to tell a joke as you're talking about spiritual truth or uh, telling a story, a personal interest thing. Not at all. It's, that's kind of like salt to soup. I think it was Matthew Henry that said, a little salt in soup is good. All salt is no soup, okay? So we preach not ourselves, but we preach from ourselves. We're servants, slaves, let's put it that way, who proclaim a crucified, risen, returning in power Savior. Now, I actually will get to the next few points, I think. So, did you notice though, so what we, let me just recover this. Are you all with me? There's a lot, I know. Our motivation, the mercy of God. Our renunciation, not gonna mess with God's word, not gonna water it down. Our realization, people are blind. Our proclamation, Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, did you notice in verse 4, I, I, I think anyway, um, rather verse 5, um, the tone, it kind of it starts off bright, then kind of goes dark, right? Blindness and all that. And then it starts to take off with our proclamation. But I think if the tone begins to rise in verse 5, in verse 6, it goes hairier jet vertical. And that's why I'm calling this point our jubilation, our excitement, our exaltation. The point that Paul is making in verse 6 is this, that, that as you share the gospel as feebly as it feels like for all of us, in all the places that you share the gospel, in all the ways that you share the gospel, God is able to take a person who's veiled, you know, blind. Their mentality is, hey, dude, that's nothing but mythology. Hey, I'm glad you found your path. You know, all that kind of stuff that people say. God is able to take that person and give them sight so they say whoa is this really true man i'm a sinner but jesus is a great savior and i want him in my life god is able to do that and he goes back he hearkens back to day one of creation and, and basically is saying this same god who gave day one of creation is able to create day one in christ for even the most darkened depraved sinner look at what, how he puts it i love this this is, this is Harrier Jet stuff. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Again, let me make this plain. He is saying, the same God who said, let there be light over the darkness of creation can say, let there be life over the deadness of a still blinded person. That is the power and grace of God. And, there, and there's some past tense stuff going on here. He says, has shown. You, you, you heard me read that. And he, he, what, what he wants them to do is he wants them to look back. I want you to look back. That when you trusted Christ, however you came to Christ, VBS, as an adult, praying a prayer, if you really came to Christ, that's because God supernaturally and decisively did something in your heart that you weren't aware of, but it's why you came to believe. Theologians call this the effectual call. It's just called turning the light on. I like to call it the Lazarean call. Remember Lazarus, he's dead four days. Maybe his flesh is pushing worms now. And boom, Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. He comes forth whole, alive, right? And that's a picture of what he does when people are saved. God turns their hearts towards himself. The Old Covenant, chapter 3, you have no time to go through it. He taught, in Old Testament, in Old Covenant, chapter 3, 2 Corinthians, there was, he says there's a glory of the Old Covenant. There was a glory, because everything God does is glorious, right? But ultimately, it was a glory of condemnation. Paul is making the point that the glory of the new covenant is even more glorious because it is a glory of salvation. 
It is glorious because when someone comes to faith in Christ, it's like the, the heart transplant specialist of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, who specializes in regeneration, rips out that heart of stone and gives that person a heart of flesh to see his sin and to love her Savior. It's literally being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love. It is literally becoming a new creation in Christ. And Paul is jubilant that as we proclaim the gospel, God has the power to do that. So stick with the stuff. When you're tempted to become weary to the point of quitting and wobbly to the point of compromising, don't forget there is a God who makes dead things alive. Now I'm going to run, 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 run. I'm going to give you this, our humiliation. Because while we're to be jubilant, we're definitely not to be arrogant. Let's not confuse the two. We easily do, right? Why should we not be arrogant? Verse 7, we are earthen vessels. We are clay pots. Sometimes crack pots, okay? Of course we're going to feel weak. We kind of are. <laughs> of course we're going to be inimpressive. We decidedly are. And of course people are going to mistreat us. What did you think happened when, by God's grace, you signed on to follow a crucified Savior? But you know what? God set it up this way so that the surpassing power would belong to him. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And by the way, so it is with the Savior, so it is with us. You go to Philippians 2. It was who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, boom, of no reputation, down. And took upon him the form of a servant, down. And being found in fashion of a servant, he became obedient unto death, down, even the death of the cross. Down, 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 down. Next verse, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given a name above every other name. Listen, so it is with sa the Savior, so it is with you. If you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, man, you're going to save it. And you will be super exalted with Christ into glory forever. Now we drop down to verses 16 through 18. Again, that phrase that he repeats, so we do not lose heart. It's actually eight points. I feel safe enough to tell you that, okay? We're on number seven, all right? Our calculation. Paul was a PhD, had a PhD in the school of suffering. Most of us are kindergartners. Maybe we got the late elementary, maybe middle school. Not to minimize the suffering that we have experienced, some serious stuff. I know we have. But Paul, he experienced massive suffering inside the church, as I said, the intro and outside the church. And yet Paul has the audacity to say, light affliction? Dude, is there something twisted with you, Paul? How can you say that was light? How can you say what I'm going through is light? Look at what he writes, verse 6. So we do not lose heart, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for, or because, this light momentary affliction. So I, I wanted to ask him, well, how do you call, forget your affliction, I've, I've experienced some affliction, how can you call it light? That's a good question. You should ask the Bible questions like that because the Bible will give you answers. And he calls it light for two reasons. Number one, because he calls it momentary. And you think about it, even in, even in this life, a lot of our deep afflictions are really just that, momentary. All of us can think through, think back on some anguishing trial that you've, it's over and you've actually forgotten about it, right? In fact, now when you think about it, you kind of laugh that it stressed you out so much. It was light. But we do experience afflictions in this life that don't seem so light because they, they might be lifelong. Maybe you were born with a certain physical condition that you're going to experience all 79 years of your life. Or maybe there is uh, 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 just a catastrophe that lands in your life or your family and you're, you're never going to be the same again for the rest of your life, whether it happened when you're 20 or 30 or 40. The vets talk about this, what they experience in combat. But even on, if you, if you, if you get up on, on, on the racetrack of eternity, it doesn't even register, even lifelong stuff, but a split second, click, click, 
compared to eternity. And so Paul can say even lifelong stuff is momentary. Now, to the point that I'm making, though, the reason he calls it light is not just because it's momentary, because of what it is preparing for you. I want you to think of one of those old school, I don't know, brass scales. They have these pans and maybe chains coming out the side. You know what I'm talking about? Now put, put on one side of that scale all of your suffering. The stuff that you, you have a hard time even talking to, your closest friends to, your kids, your spouse, whoever. That it, you put all that on that, boom, that pan hits the floor and then some, right? Because you've, you, you, you've experienced some things, some of you. But Paul is saying, when God drops on the other side of that, the glory that you've been accruing by walking faithfully with him through that suffering, man, that's going to shoot your suffering off and never, never land. You see, Jesus never said following him would be easy. We ought to be clear about that. He never said that. For one, you become a high-priority target for the enemy. For number two, you have a, a, still have a fallen nature. But what he is saying is what I have for you, an eternal weight of glory is going to blow you away. You say, what is that eternal weight of glory? I have really no idea, okay? I just think it's going to be really sweet, right? What he is telling us, what he is telling us is this, is that you don't want to squander the weight of glory that's being accrued to your everlasting account by becoming weary to the point of quitting or wobbly to the point of compromising. Because your light momentary affliction you experience with him right now as you walk with him is going to produce for you an eternal weight of glory that you will experience forever. I would say that's some kind of currency exchange, right? Right? So when things are hard, do the math, <laughs> do the calculation, exchange that currency in your thinking. That's what R. Kent Hughes tells us to do when he says, quote, Paul did not focus his thoughts on how heavy the affliction was, but on, on how heavy the glory would be because of the affliction. If we, in the midst of our affliction, will see it as it is, we will find our voices again, and we will be able to sing songs even in the darkest night. End quote. Now I close with this, our attention. He says, preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are seen are eternal. The, wor the word look isn't like a glancing look. It's rather a gazing look. It is a look that has to do with really peering at something, really giving your attention to it. And what he is telling us is we must peer upon that which we cannot see. Because that which we cannot see, in a very real sense, is more real than, than the platform I'm standing on. Because everything we can see, it's passing away. The grass withers and the flower fades the healthiest human being ever they eat all the right foods and all that they're still going to die paul is not saying that matter and material he's not is bad he's not a gnostic he's not saying that living in in a certain way doesn't matter of course it does he said it was good over creation it was very good over humans so though we're depraved we also are made in the image of god so Life and stuff we can see is not inherently bad. But what he is saying is you can't build your life on that. That's not what your life is about. You live life here with an eye to up there. Because you've heard that silly quote, That's, that person's too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Well, according to Paul, if you're not heavenly minded, you won't be any earthly good. And so what he is saying is get your eyes up. I have been guilty of this, I'm sure, and most of you have, but maybe you've been out for, to dinner at some point, and you see a couple or a family, a next table over, and they're all peering at their dumb phones, smartphones, right? And you start thinking, man, you guys are out for dinner. You're, you're spending money to eat dinner. Why don't you put those down and put your eyes up and interact with each other, hear from each other, share with each other, have fun with each other, talk serious, talk funny, whatever. 
But that's a bit like us, is it not? And I end this sermon with a call for this church to put your eyes up. How do you put your eyes up? You do it through God's word, by his spirit, with his people. And I really believe that if you embrace the simple truths that Paul has given us in the face of the temptation to become weary and quit and wobbly and compromised is you remember your motivation, the mercy of God. You renounce messing with God's word, watering it down. You realize, hey, people are blind. But you say, I'm going to proclaim Jesus because I am going to celebrate the fact God can make dead things alive. I'm going to stay humble because it's all his glory, not mine. I'm clay pot, crack pot. And I am going to do the math when things are hard so that I understand what God is doing now is going to translate into something crazy cool forever. And therefore, I'm going to keep my eyes up on things above. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Amen? Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Father, I pray that you would use this truth in the hearts of people here. I pray that it would marinate deeply. And Lord, that there would be a stickiness to this word that would impact how we address the stuff of life later today and this week. And Lord, I pray that there's anyone here who has never trusted Christ but wants to, that they would understand it is by the grace of God that they're getting that Lazarian call. They would just collapse at the foot of the cross. I pray for anybody who's walking in sin, Lord, that they would understand that this Savior not only saves us decisively when he justifies us, but he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we walk in the light and confess our sins. So would they come back to that light and confess their sin and walk in love with you. And I pray for the person here who's just so discouraged. They're, they're not ready to tap out. Lord, I pray over them, Philippians 1, 6, that we can be confident of this very thing, that you who have begun a good work in us will perform it through the day of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name, and only because you loved us first and sent him for us. Amen.